Latin America will long remember what went down Wednesday in Peru. President Pedro Castillo taking a live television to dissolve a hostile Congress. But neither his cabinet nor the military followed. By the day's end, he was the one out of a job and behind bars for attempting a coup. In his 16-month scandal-ridden stint, how did the 53-year-old left-wing trade unionist fail so badly in his campaign pledge, after all, which was to stamp out the corruption that's plagued the country's political elites. Is it about the man or is it about Peru, a nation now on its sixth president in as many years? Castillo's attempted power grab smacks of the one that succeeded back in 1992. The perpetrator then, President Alberto Fujimori, the father of the now opposition leader, Keiko Fujimori. Um, he is still in jail on corruption charges. She is supporting the institutions, as we'll hear. But the story of Peru the last 25 years has also included notable successes. For years, sustained growth that seemed to ignore political turmoil, strong development, and the decline of a brutal armed insurgency in the cocoa-growing hinterland. Why can't the country fix its politics? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking what next for Peru. Joining us from Lima, Denise rodriguez Alivari, political scientist with Berlin's Humboldt University. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, quite an eventful week I had so far. It, it's been an eventful uh, 48 hours for certain. Uh, yeah, a week, you could say. We'll talk, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, f uh, we're also joined... Um, uh, from the, uh, uh, we're also joined by Henry Raphael, president of the uh, uh, Institute of Political Communications and Government Affairs. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. Jorge Sanchez Perez joins us from Edmonton and Western Canada, assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Alberta. Welcome. Thank you for having us here. And thank you for the invitation. And I would agree with everybody. It's been an eventful week or eventful 25 years. Eventful 25 years. Uh, the France 24 debate where you could join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. You have the hashtag is F24 debate. Yeah, Pedro, Pedro Castillo had, had gone through, Castillo had gone through 80 cabinet ministers in 16 months. He'd survived two previous impeachment attempts. This time, the showdown proved too much. Brian Quinn has the story. A day of high drama and history in Peru, as Dina Boluarte was sworn in Wednesday as the country's first ever female president. Boluarte seeking to calm the waters amid a profound political crisis. I request a political truce to install a government of national unity. What I am asking for is a deadline, valuable time to rescue our country from corruption and misrule. Her predecessor, left-wing President Pedro Castillo, is now in police custody on charges of rebellion and conspiracy. Earlier Wednesday, facing a third attempt by the country's right-wing congressional opposition to impeach him, he announced his intention to dissolve Congress and declare a state of emergency. Dissolver. I will call elections as soon as possible for a new Congress with constituent powers to draft a new constitution within a period of no more than nine months as of this date and until the new Congress is established, it will be governed by decree law. That move, though, backfired as members of his own cabinet resigned in protest with the police and military warning that his actions were unconstitutional. With 101 votes in favor, six against, and 10 abstentions, Congress quickly voted to remove Castillo from office on grounds of moral incapacity. His arrest sparked street protests in the capital, Lima, by his supporters, who faced off with demonstrators supporting his ouster. Recent years have seen a period of severe instability in Peruvian politics amid a long-running conflict between the executive and legislative branches. Boluarte says she will serve out the remainder of Castillo's term until July 2026. Uh, Denise Rodriguez Olivari, before I ask you about the latest and uh, the first appearance in court uh, of uh, Pedro Castillo uh, since he was ousted, uh, first off, how was your Wednesday? <laughs> as eventful as it comes, I mean, um, I'm based in Berlin and uh, 
now moving to Florence and now I'm visiting family and friends in Lima for the holidays and what the holidays we will have. This is our seventh president in five years. This is way too much. Now we have the first woman president under quite a um, difficult situation. Uh, right now, another president is facing justice. Uh, this is um, along with the other former president since the return of democracy in 2001 that are already uh, facing jail time or even accusations, one of them who killed himself during the judicial uh, diligence. So this is not, um, I, will, I would like the, the people in the audience to understand it's not a one-off. This is a series of uh, quite worrisome events that have been occurring in Peruvian politics for a long time. Uh, occurring for a long time. Uh, there was no escape on Wednesday for Castillo. When the Mexican embassy hinted it could offer asylum, uh, protesters, we could show you the images, were quick to gather uh, outside the gates, closing off the avenue. There you see the images. In fact, we've had a reaction, uh, Henry Rafael, from uh, Mexico's president. Uh, he brands what's happened in the last 24 hours as a soft coup. Uh, he says that, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll read to you what uh, uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador uh, is uh, stated as uh, saying uh, that uh, uh, it's no longer military intervention. It's done with control of the media by the oligarchs undermining legal and legitimately const constituted authorities. So this is a, a story that's playing out according to your political coloring uh, throughout Latin America and being told uh, in various ways. Well, I, I believe that uh, the situation that we have had here in Peru yesterday, uh, it refers to what has, is happening in Latin America because nobody has seen a president like Pedro Castillo without any kind of power and any kind of uh, consultation with his parties, even in Peru and outside the country. Uh, in the uh, hours before what happened yesterday, the OAS was supporting Pedro Castillo and was supporting the effort of Pedro Castillo to maintain his maintain himself in power. And suddenly he comes up with this speech on TV and the ministers were, you know, resigning, you know, from time to time in the in the next few two hours. And even the OAS didn't say anything until the Novo Duarte strong into the presidency, and uh, even uh, the general secretary of the OES had to say that there was a coup of that. So uh, I believe that this situation that happened in Peru differs to what we are seeing in Latin America in political matters, because nobody has seen a, a president uh, isolating himself from everything. And why? Why this. is that? Why did he? Why did he? he he didn't have the support of his own cabinet. He didn't have the support of the police, the army. Why? That's a big question that we still are expecting to, to find, because at the beginning, when, when she was addressing to the people in, in TV, some, even myself, thought that he had the support of the police and the, 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 the army, but he didn't. And it, it's interesting because this is one little thing that is very important to notice. He didn't only shut up the Congress. He also, in his speech, tried to intervene the Supreme Court, the, the Attorney General Office, the, the Constitutional uh, Trial, the, the, the Constitutional Supreme Court, and also an institutional called the Junta Nacional de Justicia, which is in charge to name, uh, of naming um, attorneys and, and judges. Why he did that? He exactly almost repeated the same speech that Alberto Fujimori did in, in 20, 30 years ago. He did that without the support of the army and without the support of the people, because let's remind that he was having most, of, near of 80% of people insatisfied, dissatisfied with his government. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have the support of the people, he didn't have the support of his own government, and he didn't have, he didn't have the support of the, the, the army. Why he, why he did that? 
That's a question that we don't understand still, and we still have answer, and we're still expecting this answer to come up uh, in the investigation that the attorney is doing at this very moment. Jorge Sanchez Perez, as, as Denise said at the outset, uh, we, we started hearing grumblings over the weekend, but have you been able to make sense of what transpired on Wednesday in Lima? Uh, yes, I, I, I heard the rumors, and we have to understand that a lot of the rumors come from media that has been highly uh, aggressive towards Castillo. And so there is, there is a, that is a fact. There's a large segment of the Peruvian media that never accepted Castillo. For whatever reason, racism might be involved, uh, oligarchy uh, movements might be at play, etc. But they were never fond of Castillo. So there were a lot of gossips going around the country about hordes of leftist supporters of Castillo getting ready to storm Congress. And like, uh, uh, like, like it was said before, Castillo doesn't have the support of hordes to storm anything. That is a fact. Uh, so the rumors seem to be more grounded on the fears of the right wing of what of what Castillo could do if he had support that he never had. Uh, that being said, I I honestly, for all the speculation that we might have, cannot figure for my life why he decided to do this because this must be the stupidest coup de tat that we have seen in the history of, if not Latin America, the world. Uh, we're, we're getting those those first images of uh, uh, you just saw them uh, a glimpse of them there of uh, um, the, the now former president uh, in being uh, uh, charged. He is uh, arraigned in court. If you uh, he's being held, uh, um, uh, of, uh, uh, he's not formally charged. He's under investigation for uh, rebellion. Uh, uh, according to the court proceedings and these uh, these images that we're, we're showing you, these are not live images, but they came in uh, just moments ago to to us. Um, so, D Denise Rodriguez Olivari, what happens? F f f first of all, l before we talk about what happens next, why did Pedro Castillo make this power grab? I mean, it's something um, I have been reflecting on, and I, I guess a lot of political pundits and political analysts have been reflecting on. Um, I guess my first, my first guess is that he felt like he was going to lose. He was facing a third impeachment process, and although I, I believe that the Congress didn't reach enough votes to oust him out of power, you need two thirds majority for that. He didn't have. I mean, Congress. Uh, didn't manage to get enough votes, the, the first and the second attempt. And I don't think the third one could be the one that actually turned the table down. But I I felt that he acted uh, quite preventively in a haste, uh, hasty uh, manner. And uh, it really it didn't pay it off at all. He didn't have support of any of the ministers, all ministers renounced, not the armed forces. Let's remember that Latin America has a history of military for a long time. So I, I don't know what he's thinking. I think now the cost, the reputational cost of being involved in a coup or a set coup are quite high. Let's remember that there's the Inter-American um, Democratic Charter in place uh, can be invoked in one of these um, moments. I mean, one of the three scenarios where the um, Democratic clause from the Organization of American State can be invoked, it's a coup, a self-coup, and the erosion of democracy. And uh, this is clearly a textbook case of what a self coup looks like. Failed, very uh, not effective, only lasted 88 minutes, but it was a self coup uh, either way. All right, so self coup on the part of uh, of uh, the, the, the uh, of Pedro Castillo. Uh, let's talk a minute about Dina Boluarte. Uh, Peru now has its first uh, female president, 60 years old, a lawyer by training. Um, and we heard a clip of her in that report saying that she was calling for national unity uh, in the face of what's happening. Um, we've uh, seen remarks uh, in the past hour uh, where she says uh, she uh, is calling early elections, quote, could be democratically respectable, 
but adding she wants to hold uh, additional uh, discussions. Uh, Boluarte, who also served as minister uh, under her predecessor and who resigned at the end of last month, uh, which makes for an awkward moment, Denise rodriguez Olivari. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, we have to we have to wait because Dina Boluarte herself is facing some accusations of corruption. So, well, in Peruvian politics, uh, virtually every politician is facing some kind of accusation. So the rumor in the street is that, OK, now that Dina is in power, we have to wait and see what these um, scandals and accusations will eventually fly. So she won't have any rest. She won't have any honeymoon period, unfortunately, not even Castillo. So she, I think she's in an even more precarious situation than Castillo was. She doesn't have a, a party. She is uh, trying to make up a cabinet. There are a lot of rumors of who and um, from which parties these new members will be. Uh, I've been reading a lot about this. Uh, people inside the government, uh, technocrats, people that are public servants. Let, let's have in, in mind that a lot of brain drain happened during Castillo's government. A lot of people left um, public offices in, in Peru because of the inefficiency and incompetence of this government. So it's quite serious. Um, all the effects that we'll see from Castillo's government, um, they are still, um, we're waiting to see for the long run. We cannot assess the amount of uh, corruption, uh, amount of money lost due to incompetence and the brain drain, as I mentioned, of public servants. Uh, Henry Rafael, could uh, Dino Boluarte uh, be a safe pair of hands for the time being? She's somebody who... Uh, uh, doesn't have, as, as, as you heard, a, a big political following. She was expelled from the Marxist party she used to belong to. Uh, but she's saying that she wants things to go by the rules and she is open to the idea of early elections. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I believe that uh, Dina Boluarte has uh, the experience, the political experience, to manage this situation in better shape than Castillo has done. First of all, one of the best things that she has done, in my view, is to recognize that we had a coup d'etat. And the second thing that she has to, to do, maybe, is to recognize that we had a president, um, I'm saying about Pedro Castillo, we had a president uh, who was corrupted. He's been charged with on all, not only the rebellion and conspiracy for what he did yesterday, he has six charges for a uh, criminal organization to profit from government contractors and uh, obstructing their, their justice. And he has showed to the world that he didn't only have uh, moral incapacity to manage the government, he had all the incapacities to manage the government. And Dina Baluarte has to do what he has promised yesterday. She has to reunite the uh, social and political movements here, uh, naming a cabinet, uh, as she has called, uh, with different blocks, but a cabinet that could call technical and professional people with good credentials to manage, first of all, the economy, which is the main problem for the Peruvian people, and the second part is to maintain the stabilization of the political situation in Peru. If she can handle those two things, I do believe that she can manage the government until 2026 as she wants. Up until 2026, so no, no early elections. Jorge Sanchez Perez, your thoughts? Well, I highly doubt that it's going to last that long. And this is not me being a pessimist. This is me taking into consideration the last 25 years. <clears throat> Let me explain. Or at least the last 22 years, or 20 years. Uh, the Peruvian Constitution of 1992, the one that, uh, uh, 93, the Constitution of Fujimori, was meant to basically give all the power to the president because Fujimori meant it to be that way. It's a poorly designed constitution. So the institutions that emerged from that system were weak from the beginning. They gained some stability and some power despite the political actors, not because of them. And the constitution that was meant to give Fujimori basically unlimited power was little by little shifted once Fujimori was removed from office, uh, because he was the original dictator of these last years, uh, was shifted to give that power back to a Congress 
ruled by mostly members of Fujimori party. So the constitution in most countries is, a, is supposed to be a tool to regulate the government power, right? The, uh, to regulate uh, freedoms, positive, negatives, etc. In Peru, the constitution has become a tool for interpretation to hold on or to win some more power. So under those circumstances, Dina will have to face uh, a Congress that is hell-bent on not losing any of the power it has gained, and furthermore, is going to have to deal with those who want to remove her to establish Congress as the only power without checks in the country. All right, well, Jorge, let me, let me get your reaction to this reaction. Uh, it is uh, the leader of the opposition, the same one who tried to contest her loss in the 2021 presidential election, Kaiko Fujimori, standing by, she says, the institutions of the state, taking to Twitter to uh, proclaim it. Um, she says uh, that... Uh, um, uh, that uh, this is not a time for ideology, for right or left. President Boluarte, we wish you success in the formation of a government of national unity. Jorge Sanchez Perez, your reaction? My reaction is that I can hardly believe anything that Keiko said. Let's remember, she put her own brother in jail for trying to release her father from jail, right? So Keiko has a history of destroying her own family for the sake of power despite claiming that she lost her family. So maybe I'm overreacting here, but really, she's investigated for several charges, right? Uh, corruption, money laundering, etc. Members of her party are involved with even what we might rightfully call genocide, and we, she still defends them. And some of the members of her party were investigated by the DEA, right? So how are we supposed to really believe she's supporting Dina Boluarte at this time when all she has been doing is basically eroding all the bases of the system to gain more political power. And this is not to say that she is responsible for what Castillo has done. No, Castillo is the one who chose to, you know, get himself involved with corruption and make poor decisions and stage a coup. Let's call it, even if we call it a soft coup, it was a coup. Uh, but Keiko is responsible for all these other things. And she has promised and promised over again to respect the system. But every time she loses, she is hell-bent on destroying it. Keiko Fujimori, again, the daughter of uh, uh, Alberto Fujimori, um, who, uh, uh, who back in uh, 1992 uh, took, uh, basically uh, abrogated uh, the constitutional order and uh, held on to power until 2001. Henry Rafael, do you agree with, uh, with Jorge that uh, uh, the, the, a government of national unity won't fly? I, no, I disagree. I do believe that a, a, a government of unity could maintain the stabilization uh, that we need in Peru. Uh, but I disagree in terms of what Keiko Fujimori means now to the political arena, to the political issues here in Peru. Uh, she is not, I mean, I would tell you that if she was, if she runs now for election, she would lose largely because she's not anymore uh, a, a figure, a public figure that uh, it's important for the political movement here in Peru. So uh, I think that she is not anymore a key element of the political movement here in Peru. And uh, she has lost power. And I, I think that my, uh, in the opposite, I believe that the, the, the leftist and the people from the left they are trying to um, uh, to keep Fujimori's alive because that's the way how they've been winning elections. Remember, they uh, Castillo won the election not only for you know people who were supporting him, but most the, the people who was voting against Keiko Fujimori. So they need Keiko, Keiko Fujimori alive in terms of survive to the to 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 this political turmoil that we're having in Peru. Because let's uh, let, let's say. It, this has been a lost, I mean, Castillo leaving the government is a loss not only for his party, because he doesn't have a party actually, but it's a loss for the left, the leftist side who has been trying to, to, to maintain the government. And uh, well, now we know that they, they, they don't have it anymore because they were, uh, 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 they were charged with corruption. And we are seeing now Pedro Castillo, his leader, in jail. And we've seen that uh, the the, the um, uh, corruption scandals 
uh, have uh, tarred both left and right in Peru. The world was stunned back in 2019 when the country's former president committed suicide when police were coming to apprehend him as part of the Odebrecht corruption scandal. Alan Garcia was uh, one of four former Peruvian presidents suspected of taking bribes from the Brazilian construction company. Uh, some $29 million uh, meted out in kickbacks by Odebrecht between 2005 and 2014 uh, in, in Peru. Uh, you, Denise Rodriguez Olivari, your thoughts on, on, on is, is there this kind of ghost of Odebrecht hanging over Peruvian politics? Well, definitely. I have to say, and I have to make this disclaimer, this is the, uh, my dissertation topic. I'm currently finishing my, my doctorate on the Lava Yato case still in Peru. So I definitely believe there is a shadow of Odebrecht and uh, the Lava Yato case uh, involved in Peruvian politics, not only on the politicians that are involved in um, allegedly corruption, let's say, because nobody actually got a sentence yet, but the, what, is, uh, what the Peruvian case can bring to the table? First of all, is that we see that um, virtually every president since <clears throat> the return of democracy has involved in this case, regardless of where they play themselves in the ideological spectrum. For example, compared to Brazil, that most of the people that have been involved and incarcerated and sentenced belong to one side of the spectrum, the left side. Here in Peru, we'll see that the, the event was kind of um, uh, uh, brought so the second thing is that since we don't have stable parties, we don't see what will happen, for example, in Chile or Mexico, that political parties tend to shield themselves and shield their politicians from um, justice. Here in Peru, it was like every man or woman for its own. And what well, we see that the first the first one to, to go down was Ollantumala, who was president and then was facing justice because he didn't have any politician to back him or a party that could support him or, or promote some kind of um, uh, a structure or um, something that, for example, happened with Alan Garcia and Keiko Fujimori. They, so they hold have, on, if I, under, if I understand you correctly, Denise, what you're saying is it's, it's not that Peru is more corrupt than its neighbors. It's that in Peru, you have a system where uh, the institutions are stronger sometimes than the political parties, and therefore the politicians uh, can't shield themselves uh, when they're caught uh, with their hands in the cookie jar. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the, uh, the, the positive externalities of having a precarious political system is that the political system cannot um, help people from preventing them from help being held in accountable for corruption, unlike Chile or Mexico. It sounds quite harsh, and it's, I think, one of the things that have allowed this anti-corruption momentum to happen. But on the other side, everything that is, uh, for example, understood as uh, malfeasant can be judged as corruption, and that's um, a, one of the negative sides. What happens when this case is over? what is left in our political um, system? What is the vacuum of power that will be filled by something? And then I think one thing we need to have in mind is that it will be filled with uh, uh, populist or uh, even um, hard stand leftist or rightist uh, politician. And uh, the, 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 just talking about uh, those Odebrecht years, uh, which, uh, again, this was uh, there were scandals that were uncovered throughout uh, Latin America. Those years overlap with those of Brazil's once and future president, Luis Inácio Lula da Silva. Lula, who will be sworn in January 1st for a new term, he's issued a statement reacting uh, to what's unfolded in, in Peru in the last 24 hours. says, it's always unfortunate when a democratically elected president suffers such a fate but I understand that everything happened within the constitutional framework. End quote. Uh, Jorge Sanchez Perez, your reaction? Well, you know, besides being a philosopher, I'm also a trained lawyer. So I can tell you that sometimes the Constitution goes beyond what is written down, right? And Peru's Constitution, even at that point, is still weak. Like I was mentioning before, uh, yes, the process to remove Castillo was... I think it was constitutionally properly framed. Uh, it was properly framed under the Constitution. The issue is that 
because the Constitution is shaped in such a poor way, I don't see the Constitution holding Dina Boluarte in place in the next few years or months, right? I sadly was uh, talking to some academics that work in Latin America, and one of the one of the sad jokes that or sad commentaries was, "How long do you think Castillo is going to last?" And the most optimistic one was like a couple of years, right? Why? Because the system is not meant to be a is not meant to allow anybody to keep power unless they can negotiate with some really shady forces within Congress, which is, you know, mostly shady forces at this point. Again, because of the lack of parties that Denise was mentioning, we have now we have people that don't get filtered, just get get enough money to participate in any of these shell parties, get into Congress. And last time that there was a coup in Peru, Merino, in a few years ago. Um, uh, I don't know, well, maybe you remember this. Uh, one of the first things that Congress did once they took over was eliminate environmental restrictions to allow the forestation of the Amazon and try to relax the illegal mining, uh, the, the rules against illegal mining, again, to destroy parts of the Amazon. So there's all these shady interests that now are have taken the place of political parties, just small mafias. So they are the ones that eventually will hold in their hands the, uh, the decision to remove or not uh, Dina Boluarte, because the Constitution has become such a weak instrument. So a sort of Damocles over her head. Uh, Henry Raphael, your, your thoughts on this and, and how um, the, the, it's uh, part of the answer, as we've heard in this discussion, is uh, past corruption scandals that have uh, uh, haunted both sides. And part of it is weak institutions. Your, your, your thoughts on how you fix it all now? Yeah, well, I don't believe that uh, the problem in Peru is based on the constitutional framework. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that the change of constitution wouldn't change anything at all. I do believe that, yes, we have a weak, uh, weak institutions, but those institutions are weak because of the, uh, the type of uh, politicians who are be, who, who who has been in charge of who are in charge of those institutions and made those institutions weak, especially the Congress. Yes, the Congress has a lacking of confidence of the people, and the Congress has a large kind of problems, amount of problems with some of the decisions that they don't deal with. You know, uh, public politics or good public politics. But however, I I I, I find now that. Um, this very moment that we are living in Peru with Dina Boluarte can give us an open door to give us some time of peace and time some of stabilization. Uh, the, the, the people need that kind of stabilization because Peru's inflation rate is at its highest rate is, uh, in decades. So, as I said before, if Dina Boluarte points out somebody in the Ministry of Economy who can't handle the economy in better shape, then everything can relate to that stabilis to that mo to that moment of the economy, and then at least at least we can fix some of the the uh, this weak situation that we have in, in the institutions uh, by the moment. I I I and the thing in, in the thing that I agree with with the other colleagues are that is the uh, I do believe that if we have next election in 2026, that's going to be the moment that we, the Peruvians, need to decide if we are willing to keep having this uh, leadership without knowledge, without uh, uh, capacity to, to, to rule a, 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 a government, or we, need, or we can elect something, you know, with a capacity to do it better, and without this uh, constant election of having to vote against somebody. All, right, all, the, all this, this, all, all, all this, this instability that's happening and through all the turmoil, there's a mystery that needs enlightening. Why, despite all this change of, uh, uh, these changes of presidents, these <coughs> impeachments, these jailings, has Peru's economy, uh, if you look at the long run, not the short term, but the long run, proved so resilient, the growth uh, at times has been uh, spectacular. And uh, e e the uh, development indicators uh, are, are all look very positive for the last uh, two decades. Jorge Sanchez Perez, are you able to do business in Peru and ignore <coughs> the politics or what, what or the numbers wrong? What is it? 
Well, I think that one of the main issues to talk about economic success, without me being a, a specialist on the area, is that we have a central reserve bank that is highly efficient and, and is independent. It has managed to stay away from these political debates that are tangled with corruption. And basically, it, it's a technocratic body. But it's not, now, just, it's not just the central bank, right? Because uh, Castillo came in on a left-wing platform. He said he was going to nationalize, he was going to do all these things. But in the end, he, he, his economics uh, didn't uh, break the bank. Yeah, I mean, anybody who has any knowledge of Peruvian society knew that Castillo was not going to do one-tenth of what he promised. Why? Because society has, for the better or worse, enjoyed some kind of improvement of its living conditions since the early 90s. And that is just a fact. Now, that being said, one of the main issues is not the amount of money that's in the country or the amount of reserves that Peru may have, is the, is the inequalities, right? Inequality keeps on being the main issue. So yes, in our macro numbers are going to be great because there is some increase of money coming into the country because of the very design of a free market economy, uh, which also makes us more vulnerable to, to foreign capitals that come and go, you know? Uh, so there are many many reasons why we can explain this economic success in the region. But again, the economic success might be better at the macro level. And once we look at the micro level, we're going to see that a lot of people are not, are not happy. Why? Because despite all the success there during the pandemic, we lost over a quarter million people. Why? Because there were no hospitals with enough oxygen tanks to keep people alive. So you tell me how is it how are people going to feel if you are the most stable economy in the region and yet you don't have a hospital with a gas tank and then again the free market economy and this discourse led to some of these uh, private offerings of gas tanks or oxygen tanks for for people to be sold at around 3000 US dollars so a lot of people died because they couldn't afford it so yes numbers in peru are great Macro numbers, I would agree. A micro, there has been an improvement, mainly in the coast, I would say. But in the highlands, in the Amazon, we have still that breach, that, that gap, that inequality gap that has led to many of those regions voting for somebody like Castillo who promised radical change, even though he was never able to deliver. So where you are, uh, Denise Rodriguez Olivari in Lima, uh, it's all about the political turmoil and these in, this inequality gap is not on people's radar? I think it's on the radar, but um, in terms of business-wise, I think the Central um, Reserve Bank has uh, made an amazing job keeping um, inflation, yeah, let's say, on an on a acceptable level. Let's bear in mind that Ukraine, the war in Ukraine and uh, COVID had effects on many countries' uh, economies. Let's remember, Germany has the largest uh, inflation rate in the post-war. So it's not only a problem of Castillo and Peru, as, as, as Henry was mentioning. It's quite a problem worldwide. And Peru remains stable, remain attractive for business and investors, and actually is projected to grow in a three uh, percentile point in the next year. And actually, uh, this is all uh, the work of the central bank and Julio Velarde. Julio Velarde, some people may joke that he's our um, Queen Elizabeth. He's seen so many presidents, so many ministers of finance and economy, and he's still stable in, in, in that position. Actually, one of the most um, uh, long-awaited decisions of Castillo's government was whether Julio Velarde was um, remaining in the same position, because Basically, most of the macroeconomical management relies on his um, shoulders. And I think it's quite of the job of how the Peruvian system, political system, it's not working, but it's not failing either because of the precariousness of both governments and the position and the small um, efficient islands, as we call them, as uh, the Banco Central de Reserva, which is the central reserve bank. Also, there are other bodies that are being um, held uh, efficient and stable. But let's bear in mind that many of the people that were inside this. So, uh, so what you, what you're suggesting is that that Peru can sort of plot along from political crisis to political crisis because well, the country's still running. Yeah, I mean, in terms of, in economical terms, it's still growing. It hasn't 
been hit as, as hard as other countries. Let's remember that Peru was the hardest hit country in COVID in terms of death. And despite the fact, and uh, despite the fact that inequality is extremely high, we see that the country, in terms of the big numbers, it is still running. But let's bear in mind that this economic boom has not translated to every single citizen. And that's why there is a space for a populist extremist politician to come and seize power. And that's why it's so worrisome that now that we're in a democratic transition, let's say, uh, we we have to wait and see how it turns out for uh, the rest of the regions of Peru. Let's bear in mind that Peru is a highly centralist country. So, Henry Rafael, no coup this time, but uh, there is the possibility uh, that uh, uh, democracy may be tested again very soon, is what you're hearing from Denise. You agree? Well, in Peru, always democracy is going to be tested. We have this every, every, every time. We are, I, I think, I, I, I'm trying to be positive. We have had uh, six presidents in the last six years. As Dennis said, uh, we were the worst uh, level of uh, managing the, the COVID in Latin America. And still, the economy is strong. However, unemployment and equality is still an issue for the people. Uh, quarter of the people of of the population of 33 million of people still lives in poverty. So, I that's what I'm saying that whoever politician who wants to keep the power, he has one big key. That's the management of the economy. If you manage the economy, the economy in a very shape well, it was very well done. Then the other problems of Peru make uh, diminish because. Uh, this the, the need of the people, as every everywhere in, in in the world, is to have money in their pockets. That's the thing that we haven't we haven't had in the last two years. The need of the people now is to recover employment and the, the, the economic situation. With that, I believe that Dina Boluarte and whoever comes up to the power is gonna be uh, it, you know can manage the government without any hesitation of breaking or having a coup, even worse if this comes from the military side. Jorge Sanchez Perez, we're, we're out of time, but if you were to uh, give one piece of advice to the new president, what would you tell her? I would say, uh, remember that Castillo was elected by a majority of people that believe that something better could be done with the re redistribution of resources in the country. If you keep playing the same with the same rules of the last 22 years, we might be on the verge of a social collapse. And even if Boluarte finishes her, her, her government, which I, I said previously, I doubt, the next person that comes and promises to burn everything to the ground might get more votes. And that is a true danger. Inequality is what breeds dissatisfaction. And that is a microeconomic issue, not a macroeconomic issue that has to be dealt with ASAP in Peru. Jorge Sanchez Perez, many thanks for joining us from Edmonton. I want to thank Denise Rodriguez Olivari in Lima, along with Henry Rafael. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate. Thank you.